Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to day two of the hearing sessions. And welcome to anyone who is observing in the council chamber. Is anyone in there this morning? So it's 10 o'clock, and today's hearing is now open. Can everybody hear me? Yep, just to explain the microphone system, um, push the button when you want to speak and switch it off when you've finished so that other people can speak. And it's quite important that we remember in case there is anybody observing in the council chamber. So my name is Louise Phillips, and I'm the inspector appointed by the Secretary of State to examine the Epping Forest District Local Plan. The programme officer is Louise Sinjin Howe, and she's responsible for the administration of the examination to assist me, and any correspondence with me outside these sessions should be through Louise. So, first of all, a few housekeeping matters. If anyone with a mobile phone could please ensure it's turned off or switched to silent. Um, I did ask the council to do this yesterday. I don't think we're expecting any fire alarm, but the procedure is... If, we, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, the, the procedure is to uh, follow the signs out uh, through that door and down the stairs, or if that's blocked, to go out this way and down the stairs. Um, and the toilets, while we're on it, the toilets are back out that way and on the, uh, the landings of the stairwell. Thank you very much. So we have two matters to discuss today. Um, matter two first, and then hopefully a short break, and then straight on with matter seven, so I'll take a mid-morning break. It, the aim is to be finished by, by lunchtime or a late lunch, but if, if not, then we'll take a lunch break sometime around or after one o'clock. Um, the council has asked me to just remind everybody that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of, capable of subsequent repeated viewing with copies of the recording being made available for those who request it. So by being present at this meeting, it's likely that the recording cameras will capture your image and this will result in your image becoming part <coughs> of the broadcast. You should be aware that this may infringe your human and data protection rights and if you have any concerns, then spe please speak to the webcasting officer. Um, does anyone have any concerns that they wanted to raise? About that? No, thank you. Does anyone other than the council intend to film or record the session? Thank you. Okay, in that case, I'll just ask everybody around the table to introduce themselves, please. We could start with the council. Uh, good morning, madam. Thank you. My name is Mark Beard. I'm instructed by the council. I'm a barrister instructed by the council. Uh, on today's uh, front row team for the council is Ms. Alison Blom Cooper. To her right is uh, Ms. Vicky Willis. And uh, to her right is Mr. Coleman. Later this morning, we'll have uh, Ms. Ione Braddock uh, dealing with Matter 7. Good morning, I'm uh, Tony Asprey, Asprey Planning, representing Freetown Homes. Good morning, Ma'am. It's Paul Belton from Carter Jonas, representing Pigeon Investment. Roland Bolton, SPRU of DLP Planning, um, representing Peer Group. I'm Elizabeth Byrne. I'm a resident uh, in the district in Thaden Boys. I'm speaking today just on my own behalf as I vote in independently. Thank you. Good morning, John Richards from Dundara. Good morning, Rich Cook, Essex County Council, here for Matter 7. Good morning, Laura Taylor-Green, um, Public Health, Essex County Council. Okay, are there any specific questions or matters anyone wanted to raise before we move straight on with the Matter 2 agenda? No? Thank you. Okay. So, as I explained yesterday, my agendas have sought to focus on the issues, moving on slightly from my MIQs, to, to focus on the issues where I have more questions or where clarification is needed. So we'll run through my questions first, and then if there's anything additional that isn't covered that anyone wants to raise, we, we can do that at the end of the session. So, first of all, we'll start with issue one, which is, are the context, vision, and objectives for the plan accurate and comprehensive? Now, the first item on the agenda is potential modifications for accuracy and it concerns paragraph 1.36 of the plan and figure 1.5. So my MIQs highlighted a couple of inconsistencies between the graphics and text in this section of the plan and the council has explained in its statement that figure 1.3, which is on page 7 of the plan, is accurate, but the paragraph 1.36 describing it requires an amendment to reflect the figure as set out in its statement. So 
the council statements proposes a, a modification to paragraph 1.36, reading the financial and business services, public administration, education and health, wholesale and retail and construction sectors are the most common in the district as shown in figure 1.3. Does anyone have any concerns with that modification? Nope. Okay, then that, that's, that, seems, that seems reasonable to me and we would call that as a main modification. Thank you. And similarly, we turn over the page to page nine of the plan. The council has also explained that the graph shown at figure 1.5 was included in the plan in error. It's intended that paragraph 1.43 and figure 1.5 should illustrate the need for affordable housing over the plan period, which is a total of 2,851 homes. And again, amendments are proposed in its statement to achieve this, which essentially um, results in the figure being replaced with a, a table, if I understand it correctly. Um, to, to explain, and a, a modification to paragraph 1.43 to explain the need for affordable housing. Sorry, I see Mr. Belton. Thank you, Mum. Um, I was just going to ask a quick question about this amendment in Table 1.2, actually. Um, and I have to confess, um, I've only really looked at this very rapidly this morning, so it's more a question for the Council, really. Um, in the table, um, you list that the unmet need for affordable housing from 2011 to 2016 is 665 dwellings. My question was just a bit of clarification as to where that figure came from. And the reason I asked that is this morning I was just going through each of the annual monitoring reports since the beginning of the plan period. And hopefully each of the AMRs provide as core output indicator H5, um, a figure for the affordable housing units delivered in each monitoring year. And I just simply um, multiplied all of those figures and came up with um, a total delivery of affordable housing from 2011 to be 330 dwellings, which would result in a shortfall of 913. It may well be that I've missed a critical step in the council's methodology, but um, a bit of clarification would be helpful. Um, yes, madam. The the, the table was erroneously pulled across from the draft local plan. The wrong table was pulled across when we, we updated. The figure itself comes from the Strategic Housing Market Assessment Affordable Housing Update 2017. Um, I'm just looking for the EB reference for you. It's EB 408, page 33, figure 21. So that's EB 408 figure 21 on page 33 of that document and that's the table that we've now are now proposing to include and and are you are you satisfied that those figures are accurate or would they require would they require updating to reflect current they were accurate in terms of the schmar 2017 which is what the the our housing need figures are based on the schmar 2017 so it's consistent with the other information in the plan. And, and also our evidence base. Okay, well, I, I seem to recall that for a, a future session, I think I've asked a question about whether the, the, da the data needs to be updated to reflect completions and, and cu the current position. So perhaps you could give some, that's obviously if you give some thought to that, and I'll make a note of that for, for, that, for that session. Yeah, that'll be helpful. I'll, I'll take the time to look at that reference as well in the meantime. But um, as I say, just looking at the AMRs, it, it seemed quite a straightforward calculation. So it'd be interesting maybe for the council to check if there is slight bit of inconsistency in the evidence.
Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll make a note of that for, for the, fu the future session. Are there any other sort of comments about, about the principle, perhaps of updating that? No. Okay, so if we'll record that that's a, a, a modification and we'll come back to the, the precise figures at a later date. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Then we'll, we'll move on to the, the plans, vision, and objectives. And I had asked for you to have the, um, the statement of, to have consideration for the statement of the Lee Valley Regional Park Authority. So in response to my questions three and four in my MIQs, the council has proposed additions to the vision as currently shown on page 19 of the plan. And these, in broad terms, address the, the, concerns, that I've, um, the concerns that I raised. But I do have a few additional questions, firstly concerning the statement of the Lee Valley Regional Park Authority and then a, f and a few other potential additional amendments. But if I could just first ask if anybody, apart from the fact that there, there may be a few omissions that you've requested, does anyone have any concerns about the um, additions that the council's proposing as, as shown on page five of its statement? Because then we could take that perhaps as the starting point for the discussion rather than the vision that's in the plan. Does anyone have any concerns about taking that as the starting point for the discussion? Okay. Ma'am, before we move on, I did raise an issue about emissions on the, um, on the vision with regard to the accuracy of the statement. Um, in particular, um, part two is it, made clear in our, in our submissions to you, um, and they were around this issue. In paragraph uh, 2.43 of the plan, um, it states that the new home roofs requirement for Epping Forest is 12,573. Um, if you want to look at my submission, it's uh, um, paragraphs 1.1 um, to 1 1.7. Um, so paragraph 2.43 of the plan states the requirement for new homes is 12,573. Paragraph 2.44 states that 11,400 are going to be proposed in, the, in accordance with the MOU. The vision states um, in A part two that um, housing is to meet local needs. Now clearly it is not to meet all local needs um, there will be, even on the council's own evidence, there will be a level of unmet need, um, according to the plan itself, just reading the plan on its face. Um, that level of unmet need um, will not, in my view, lead to the um, balanced communities um, that are being suggested. And I have put forward an alternative um, wording um, to deal with with that issue, um, and I think that it's, it's it's correct that the you know the vision statement is, is important. It sets a context for the plan, and it needs to be very clear about what it's doing for the local population and whether or not it's meeting meeting local needs. And I think, given the statement. At the beginning of the plan by councillors Whitebread and Phillip about, and again it's their words, the timing of the submission to, so that it's not exposed to the risk of increasing the housing requirement, that should also be put in the vision because it's clearly a main driver for the plan. So that desire, if you like, to, to get the plan in place to avoid the higher housing number is part of, you know, it's the reason extra for the plan. It's the justification for it coming forward in the form it's coming forward. 
it should be in the vision. It should be very clear that that's what the plan is doing. And I think um, to include, if you like, some niceties of words that seems to suggest to the local population that their housing needs are going to be met is, I would go as far as to say misleading. And, and it undermines the plan making process. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, similar point uh, on, on one of, uh, of consistency, which I, I think and hope would be fairly easily addressed. Um, and if you look at the vision for the uh, region, for the, the corridor, and then the uh, uh, vision for the plan uh, for the district, and then the local plan objectives, uh, there seems to be a disconnect in relation to housing in the way that wording is used. And I, uh, my, my uh, previous representatives, uh, representations uh, focus particularly on uh, the local plan objectives B, housing, where there seems to us to be a strange form of wording used because it says to make provision for the objectively assessed uh, market and affordable housing needs within the district to the extent that this is compatible with national planning policy. Not sure why the last bit is needed, but picking up on Mr. Bolton's point, that's not actually what's being done and, um, uh, in, in this case. And uh, if one looks across to, uh, to uh, uh, the MPPF uh, 12, uh, where the requirement is to meet the full objectively assessed needs, picking up on Mr. Bolton's point, it seems to me if we're not meeting full objectively assessed needs, then that needs to be made explicit. Could I ask the, the council to come back on, on that point, particularly, particularly perhaps in relation to the, um, the, the use of the OAN term in, a, in B, in, in objective B, whether that's, whether that's an appropriate form of wording? Um, Ma'am, we'll be guided by you, but we think that um, that is one of the objectives of the plan, to meet the objectively assessed market affordable housing needs within the district. And we should be clear about that. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Thank you, ma'am. It's a different point to Mr. Bolton on the vision, so I don't know if he wants to come back first. Um, it was a follow-up point. Um, I read the words, in the, and, and this is the point, is you're putting these things in the vision and objective and then simply not following it through, and I think that's misleading. I mean, if you go to the forward, it's quite clear that the timing of the plan is to avoid a higher housing number. It's, it's unequivocal. So that needs to be there. The second point is, is when one looks at how they've gone about um, site selection and, and whether or not they meet, they're, they're planning to meet the 11400 or the 12572, um, they've not left every stone unturned. I mean, that's quite clear when one looks through the, the approach they've taken to site selection and the way they've discounted sites. And we'll come on to that with site selection. But again, I do think we need to be clear about what the plan is doing and the objectives to it. Thank you, ma'am. We, we have a concern about the amendment um, to revise criteria um, XI, which is on page six of the council's statement. Um, and it's, it's really just requesting some clarification on, on how that changes the vision of the council in, in respect of sustainable transport. Sorry, sorry before, before we move on to that, can I just check that there's nothing else to be raised in terms of housing, because then we'll, we'll turn back to the wording of the, of the vision. Thank you, ma'am. 
Yeah, I, I just, and it perhaps help with some explanation why the wording uh, uh, in relation to housing uh, in the, uh, in, in the uh, uh, local plan uh, visions is in the way it is. If one looks at the economic development uh, clause, uh, clause C, little one, to meet the objectively assessed economic and town centre needs in the district. Uh, now, B, one says, to make provision for objectively assessed. I mean, I know it sounds like semantics, but just a bit of clarification as to why the d wording is different. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, 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 and to reiterate the point that Mr. Bolton has made, I agree. Okay, I'll, 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 ask, I'll ask the council to clarify that, and then I think I, I understand the points you're making around, around housing, so we'll, we'll, leave, we'll leave that now. Um, is, is, there any, is there any reason for the difference in the wording between how the housing objective and the economic development objective, for example, are expressed? They both seek to make uh, provision for the objectively assessed need. Um, it, I don't think uh, it was a deliberate intention to, to distinguish between the two, and if it would help to make them more consistent, be happy to do so. Thank you, um, Mr. Wilkinson. Did you have you, did you have anything in relation to the points that have been made? I can go back to Mr. Richards first. Absolutely not. No. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. If we if we can. Turn back to the, the vision as proposed to be amended on page five and six. I did, I did ask if anyone had any concerns about, about that as it stood. So if we deal with any concerns about what's there, what's there now, and then we'll turn to what might be missing, because I have, I've got some questions about what, what might, might need to be added to that. So Mr. Mr. Richards. Thank you, ma'am. So it's um, taking you to, to revised criteria um, XI on page six of the council's statement. Um, the original wording, which we didn't have an objection to, we had an objection to how it was applied throughout the plan, read access to places by public transport, walk, walking and cycling will be promoted. We took that as meaning that the council will promote um, access to places, either existing places or places to be created through the plan um, by public transport, whether existing public transport or new public transport or improved public transport would be promoted. So if you like, it was a catch-all to say that sustainable transport, regardless of whether it's an existing provision or a new provision, would be promoted. We're concerned that the revised wording, which reads the provision of public transport and walking and cycling infrastructure will encourage sustainable travel. The word provision, to me, talks about delivery and potentially new public transport. We're concerned that the amendment, if you like, downplays the, what we read to be the previous objective of the council, which was very much to promote public transport for existing places, new places, existing public transport hubs and new public transport hubs. We're concerned that the provision word dilutes that and it's really just a mechanism for the council to ensure that their new allocations are assessed against that criteria and actually it doesn't, it doesn't look to promote existing public transport. Could the council offer a comment on, on, on that specific point and perhaps just explain the reason for the change? I think the, reason, the main reason for the change came from uh, it reading better as a vision. It didn't seem to sit well uh, and in response to comments that we received. Um, there is absolutely an intention to encourage uh, the delivery of new public transport and walking and cycling infrastructure to encourage sustainable travel, but at the same time to uh, ensure that existing uh, public transport is also um, retained, maintained. Um, if, the, uh, if the inspector wants to suggest revisions to take account of the comments, we're happy to do so. Is there, is there a way maybe the council could have a look at, just have a look again at that criteria to ensure that it captures existing and yeah, new ha happy to do so. development? Thank you.
What's up for Christ Are you going to speak about something omitted from the regional park authority perspective? Because I will come on to that specifically. I have a, quite a big list of things about from your statement specifically. So, okay, thank you. Um, so, Mrs. Mrs. Byrne. Roman numeral X, um, where they've added in the natural environment and landscape character will be protected. I'd written specifically on this and noted that it wasn't in the vision, um, even though it's one of the strategic policies, SP7. And the only comment I have actually is to do with the syntax, because they have changed as they've gone through. And it just concludes, it says, green and blue infrastructure will have been taken, that's the to, opportunities to enhance, whereas in the rest of the um, bullet points, it says will be and I note that when they actually changed and added in, they had originally had, um, in the earlier section, um, a distinctive and attractive network of town and village centres will have been maintained. That's now being changed to will be maintained. And so, therefore, following on from that, it just seemed a little more dynamic to say it will be taken rather than it will have been. The objective, I'm sure, is the same, but we're not waiting till we get to 2033 to find out that it will have been taken. We would like it, please will be taken. Is that all right? Am I getting a nod? Yeah, we agree. Yeah. Am I the only person who's got a nod so far? <laughs> the other thing I was going to say, I come on to, if you're going to, I was going to I was like to mention the objectives because I don't think that that phraseology has actually come forward in the objectives. I haven't seen any amendments to wording in the objectives, but if you'd like to come back to that perhaps. No, that's fine. We can deal with that now. You know what to deal with that now. Okay, I'll go on then to the objectives. This obviously, the, the um, interest here was in that policy SP7, which felt to be a new dynamic policy. If you go back to the current local plan and um, alterations of 2006, you won't find the term green infrastructure. So although it's not new to many of those sitting around the table because of the work that's gone into the local plan, it will be quite new as an introduction to talk about green and blue infrastructure when the new plan is adopted. Um, and I just felt this didn't really come forward in the objectives, or the council may feel that it is, but I can't find the phraseology that really would correspond with the natural environment the landscape character will be protected. So we're looking at what is the natural environment, the landscape character, I think it's important, opportunities to enhance, and then green and blue infrastructure, I couldn't find that actually mentioned in the sections. There's a section under local plan objective starts A, environment and design, but I didn't actually find that you get that reference. Bear in mind that green infrastructure is things like hedgerows, the natural environment, and then when you come on to infrastructure itself, which can include that, there's no reference to blue or green infrastructure. There is a reference to improving accessibility to services in the countryside, but I think that's a little bit oblique, and then to provide access to green spaces and leisure play sports facilities and to make appropriate provision. But green spaces, again, there has a lot of different... Um, uh, interpretations, you're looking about natural green space, you're looking at uh, managed green space, open green spaces. So I didn't think that was specific enough to cover the idea of green infrastructure. Okay, M Mrs Byrne, can you suggest somewhere in perhaps part A of the local plan objectives where you think some additional wording should be added? Um, or do you think that's the appropriate place for it? I think I would have thought if you're looking at environment, um, what I did, I mean the only thing I could do because I was working with what we got, is looking at policy SP7. I assumed really that what tends to happen, one has a vision, then you work out your objectives, then you start to move to strategic policies. But as you move forward in that process over a long period of time, sometimes one needs to go back and think whether everything then corresponds. So you're sort of, I'm sort of going working backwards from those policies to whether that was then put into the vision and whether it was put into the objectives. So just looking at the things that I picked out as the sort of key elements of policy SP7, it says, the phraseology is going to be slightly different because of the way it's written. The council will protect um, the natural environment, enhance its quality and extend access to it. So that might cover part of the environmental design, but it is going on to another aspect when you start talking about access. Um, the council under B of policy SP7, I hope I'm not going too fast because I've got this in front of me. Am I all right because of policy? Policy B, the council will conserve and enhance the character and appearance of the countryside. So you've got the idea of conservation it might be or enhance. I'm not I'm unaware of the argument about and or. I think I do know why you put or rather than that. Um, but I, I don't think most people would know the difference there. Conserve and enhance the character of the appearance of countryside. That might be something to consider in environment and design. Okay, okay. You, you're probably going a little too I'm far. I'm going too far. But I think, I think we, we appreciate the, 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 
the, the points that you're making. And I wonder if, if the council doesn't disagree, if the easiest way might be for the council to perhaps discuss with you an amendment that could be made to the objectives right. to reflect right. the points that you're, that you're I think making. really taking it from their own wording, though, because when anybody else, like an interested party, comes along and starts wording it, I'm trying to work no, no, their quite, wording back quite, quite into right, that Quite right. Objective. It'll be for the council to word it, but yes. if you have specific <laughs> concerns and they're able to address them, then it, would, it will save you having concerns again at a later stage. So yes. Thank you very much for that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Can we, can we move on now to the, um, the list of things that I think might be om omitted from that, and then we can come back to anything else that anybody wants to say at the end. So I want to start now with the, um, the regional park authority questions that I have. Perhaps if I run through them, they might cover the points you were going to make, and then um, you can again raise any, anything additional at the end. And you'll correct me if I've misunderstood anything from your, from your statement, but the, the Regional Park Authority has suggested that the amendment to um, parts, what is now Part 7 in your statement should refer to the recreation, leisure and nature conservation aims of the park. Um, you've, you've put the recreational and nature conservation aims of the park. They've suggested it should be the recreational, leisure and nature conservation aims of the park. Um, and in light of the authority's responsibility for leisure, recreation, sport, and games, that would seem appropriate to me, unless there's a, a concern about adding in that wording. I think we've consistently used the word uh, recreational throughout the plan to mean include leisure. And we feel that that word embraces sufficiently uh, leisure faci facilities within it. And, and after all, this is, this is this is the council's vision, not the Lee Valley Regional Park Authority's vision. Mr. Wilkinson, do you, do you feel strongly about this? And do, I'm not. I'm not going to fight to the death on this. Um, but um, uh, you know, I think in terms of uh, picking up on your point, actually. Um, uh, the suggested word change is, is consistent with our statutory remit and it's, it's important for completeness sake um, and I think is germane to a discussion which might be uh, held later on the uh, Whitewater Centre. We, we are, of course, including the Lee Valley Regional Park Authority's vision and have agreed to update it and be consistent with their latest vision, which obviously does uh, highlight that point. D does the council feel very strongly about omitting the wording, given that I, I appreciate what you're saying about this is the council's vision, but I guess this, this line refers very specifically to the Lee Valley Regional Park, and obviously I think it's been raised as a matter of sort of consistency with their, with their wording. I think it's a, an issue of whether or not we be, we're consistent through our, our plan about the use of the term recreational, uh, which is we have taken to include leisure throughout the plan. Um, and the council and the members here did feel strongly about it, which is why. Um, they did feel strongly yes, about it. And that's why it's written as it is. OK. Would you mind explaining why they... Is there any significance as to why they felt strongly about I think that's a matter for them to explain rather than me. Um, you know, it's it, not it was, was something that was discussed at member workshops and that's what came out of it and that's what we've taken and brought forward. But it's not... I don't mean to ask this in a, in a funny way and it mean anything by this for want of a better word. It's not to, it's not to try to sort of deliberately avoid anything. It's, it's a matter of wording. I think it is, and, and ultimately it's a matter for you, madam. Okay, thank you.
moving, moving on to the, the Regional Park Authority's vision, um, both the Council and the Park Authority have proposed that the Authority's updated vision and strategic objectives should be included after paragraph 2.22 on page 18 of the plan. Um, which would obviously, I, I assume, replace the wording that's there in the green box. Is that right? Yep. That's correct. And, and, and I think in the hearing statements, Mr. Wilkinson has very helpfully pointed out that it, it is slightly different to, to the version that we've put in uh, the hearing statement, and we're happy to be, make sure that we're consistent. Right, okay. That would be a main modification. And then moving, moving on from that slightly, the Regional Park Authority further suggests that it's necessary to amend the last sentence of paragraph 2.24 in the plan to reflect the current proposals for the park within the plan area. Um, did Mr Wilkinson just briefly want to explain that point and I'll ask the council whether they agree. Um, thank you. Um, the... Um, the uh, paragraph refers to area proposals uh, which form part of the authority's park development framework um, and um, at the moment area 5 proposals are adopted but proposals for areas 6 and 7 will be adopted in April um, which will be during the life of this uh, examination and I think just in terms of completion in terms of consistency and completeness this 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 should be um you know uh, added into paragraph 2.24 um i also uh, consider that uh, in line with section 14.2 i think it's b of our park act that there should be um it would be helpful if a an appendix could include um all the authorities adopted proposals for areas five six and seven that be in line with our statutory provisions. That, that was going to be, but perhaps the council can come back on all of that together, because I was, first of all, is, is there any concern with basically, it seems like it's a, an update to, to paragraph 2.24 for, for accuracy, accuracy and to be up to date. But then, um, obviously, the, the, the authority has suggested the inclusion of these proposals within the plan by means of an appendix. And I just wanted to ask the, the council's views on that and whether any potential, there are any potential issues that could arise with that, and more specifically, whether it would require any amendments to the plan's policies. I think we'd have to look at whether it affects any of the plan policies, because um, we have, obviously, the, the proposals for areas six and seven, are not, as Mr. Wilkins has indicated, not yet adopted. Happy to update it say, to say for which proposals are, are now published. Um, I don't think we can say that they're adopted when we don't know what's going to happen in the future. I think we would have concerns about having appendices which may get out of date during the lifetime of the plan, and maybe it's more appropriate to uh, just refer people to the, the website and where they can find the most up-to-date information about the proposals. That's one of the questions I had. Is, is it necessary to have sort of a, a, la a large appendix to this to this plan? Is it necessary for it to be within the plan itself or would it be sufficient to have some kind of wording that would refer people to, as you say, the most the most up-to-date proposals? It, it, it's, um, it's a question of like uh, the extent to which the, the authorities um, recognition of the adopted proposals could be made and whether having a link, you know, suggesting a link or reference to um, implies that, that, that level of inclusion, which I think is the key word in section 14.
Is there any way that it could be dealt with by any amended wording to the to the plan itself? Because obviously, I appreciate if, if they haven't been they haven't been adopted yet, it might be that the council needs needs to consider them before it can just a, a, agree to it. Is, is there that is that is that how it works? Does the council is the council a consultee the, or anything like that? The authority the the, the um, partnering framework has been prepared uh, through extensive consultation with stakeholders like the district council, um, and um, and so. You know, we, we've reflected those comments in, uh, in uh, largely in, in, in the phrasing of proposals. Um, and the Park Act does, does require that, you know, inclusion of proposals in the local plans doesn't imply acceptance. So there is that leeway around um, possibly two, two sets of proposals rubbing up against each other uh, in contravention. Um, so, it, 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 you know, it's a, it's a hybrid act, the Park Act, uh, and this is, I suppose, this is the um, a crucial clause in that um, how the act is interpreted, in that it, it requires that riparian boroughs include our proposals in their plans, but inclusion does not imply acceptance, um, um, and it, you know, and it does cause people difficulties, but I think it also calls it, you know, it, it's about allows them freedom. Are you able to help us with how it's been done elsewhere? <clears throat> it, this is always a struggle. Um, well, the forest down the road accepted everything for the relevant area um, in their DMD document. Um, when you know, they, they were part of the system, as it were. Um, but other councils, it, it's, it's often very difficult. And um, I suppose to, to uh, get around this, I'd be happy to possibly look at a, a more subtle form of wording in paragraph 2.24. I, I think that would be sensible. Um, I think the main concern is that we want our plan to re remain flexible and stay up to date, and we don't want to reflect in it something that may become out of date in a short space of time. Without ducking, is it, is it possible to leave it with you to to consider a form of wording? Yes. W would you like us then to send our suggested amendment through to you? Yes, you can send it through and, and indicate whether you agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then obviously the, the formal process would be would be at the end, but we might as well have a look at it first. Yeah, thank you. They were all my questions. Did you have anything further? No, excellent. Thank you. Okay, so just t turning to some of the other other points on potential additions to the... Sorry, Ma'am, could I make Sorry. a quick comment on the Lee Valley Park, if, yes. if that's possible? Thank you. Um, we support... We support the position of the Lee Valley Regional Park Authority, um, and we don't have any particular objections about what's being discussed across the table. The, the point we wanted to make is that the, the vision and objectives set out in the plan can't be read in isolation. They're intended as a precursor to explain how the plan follows through to deliver those visions and objectives. And we do support the recognition of the council that they will revisit the plan to ensure that if they are changing the wording regarding the Lee Valley Regional Park, that that is carried through the remainder of the plan. But just to put a marker down, that, that that work is, from our perspective, does go into quite significant detail. So, for example, the site selection work does not consider the park development framework whatsoever. There's some quite, quite settlement-specific proposals within that document and within the emerging area documents regarding the role of settlement edges, the role of public transport nodes getting into the park, objectives about communities getting better access to the park, objectives about visitors being able to more legibly consider 
access into the park as well as gateway proposals and we whilst we welcome the council's recognition that they will revisit that I, we just want to put a marker down that that does go to the heart of some of the um, site assessment work where the park development framework as far as we can see from any of the work is not referenced and i think it needs to be referenced to ensure that the updated vision for the lee valley regional park isn't just some hyperbole at the beginning of the plan that isn't carried through but is actually something that's consistent and a meaningful addition to the plan to then inform the more detailed policies and that's policies about public transport provision about landscape quality as well as going towards the visitor experience and the role of the role of epping forest in terms of of, of supporting the the lee valley regional park authority in achieving that vision Did you, did you want to say anything about that at, the, at this no, point? thank you. No. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so just turning to, turning to some other points that have been raised, should the contribution of health industries re be reflected in part, what is now part eight, of the vision statement in light of it being one of the larger employers in the district. Um, part, turning to part eight of your, your amended vision, should the contribution of health industries be reflected in there in light of it being one of the larger employers in the district? <clears throat> I think we'd have to check and see because we don't recognise that as one of the significant in economic industries in the district. Construction, on the other hand, we know is a, a large employer in the district. And, uh, yeah. Okay, if, if you check on that, it's something that somebody raised in their, in their statements or in their comments, and it, I asked it really in light of um, the amendment we discussed earlier in relation to figure 1.3, which suggests that public administration, education and health are one of the more significant employers, but it might be that within that, health isn't the most significant of the three. But we say it's a common sector, but not very significant in terms of the number of employees in this district. But we'll look at it further if you like. I think you've answered my second question, which was you, you, you do recognise construction as being a big employer, and that's why you've added that in, because that, that didn't relate specifically to my questions, but you've added that in, so that, that's fine. Um, and then... So in relation to the amendment to reflect the historic environment in the vision, just to point out to others that the council also proposes to alter the definition of heritage assets in the glossary to ensure that it covers archaeological remains. Any comments? No. 
Okay, and then a more specific point that's been raised in one of the statements, do the plan's objectives reflect the need to deliver older persons housing and is this carried forward into the plan's policies? That's my last question. I think we would say that little two, new homes that are appropriate mix of sizes, types and tenures to meet local needs covers that point. And no doubt we'll discuss that when we come to discuss the housing policies later. That's my last question. Does anyone else have anything in relation to the vision and objectives that hasn't already been covered? No. Okay, thank you. So if, I, th I think we've, we've agreed to take that as the starting point. So there are a couple of amendments to be made and all of that, all of the changes to the vision could come under one main modification eventually. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So moving on to issue two. I asked, is policy SP1 concerning the presumption in favour the presumption in favour of sustainable development necessary and consistent with national policy? Um, I've put on the agenda there a potential modification to delete policy SP1 from the plan, which indicates what my initial feeling is on the matter. The Council's position, I think, in its statement, if I'm reflecting it correctly, is that policy SP1 reiterates and is intended to be consistent with national policy um, and not to depart from it. So on the basis that it's not intended to add anything to or depart from national policy, I consider that it should be deleted to avoid duplication and any potential for conflict. Um, and I'm not persuaded that the supported text in paragraphs 2.35 to 2.39 is necessary either. So I thought I'd set out my, my position and then see if anyone wants to disagree with me. Okay, there's two people that might disagree with me. No, actually, I'm going to agree with you, okay. Mom. <laughs> um, clearly, once the plan is adopted, um, the the new framework will be in place in terms of the whole of the new framework until the 2018. So you don't want to be out, of, you know, I'm not saying it changes particularly, but there are nuances in the new framework and you're best off not tying yourself to the old one, I think. So I agree. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, this is not something that my clients feel uh, terribly strongly on, but I, I thought it's worth offering an alternative perspective, and that is that uh, um, given the primacy of the development plan in deliberations um, and the fact that not everybody understands about reading across from the development plan to the framework, then uh, I see some advantage in a policy that ca contains a presumption in, in favour of sustainable development being in this local plan. Uh, my issue is with the rather eccentric wording of the policy as it's proposed, and I would rather see greater consistency with um, the, the wording in the framework. As I say, it's not something we feel strongly about, but I think quite a lot of local plans that I've come across and deal with on a day-to-day -day basis have a presumption in favour of sustainable development. And I think, as I say, given the fact that policies are read together and the primacy of the development plan, there is some advantage in having a presumption in favour of sustainable development expressed in the development plan. Okay, I, I, think, I think for now, and obviously this would be subject to consultation in due course, I think I, think I would... That there's obviously... There's, there's quite a lot of discussion about the, these policies and quite a lot of decisions and things end up turning on, on these sorts of policies. And I think if we can avoid any duplication and potential for conflict, um, I, I, think that would be, I think that would be better. If the council, I haven't, I haven't checked throughout, it's, it's, it's clear that obviously the plan would need to reflect the presumption in favour. And if there, if there was a need in the introductory text somewhere for that wording to be replaced, 
um, with an indication that that's set out in national policy, then, then I think that would be more appropriate than introducing the potential for a conflicting policy that essentially is intended to do exactly the same. We're happy with that, Madam. Okay. Thank you. So that would obviously be a main modification. <laughs> That concludes my questions in relation to matter two. Does anyone want to raise anything that hasn't already been covered? No. Thank you. Okay, so we're next going to discuss matter seven. We need a, we need a break to get the different nameplates and things around the table. Um, would, would it be long enough to come back at quarter past 11? Would you like a slightly longer? Quarter past 11. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to everybody who participated in this session. Thank you. Thank you everybody and welcome to the discussion of matter seven concerning place shaping and the general master plan approach. I think there's a, quite a few new people around the table so we'll go around the table first. We'll start again with the council. Uh, good morning, I'm Mark Beard, barrister instructed by the council. Uh, for this matter it's Mr David Coleman, planning policy manager with uh, Ms Ione Braddock and uh, Alison Long Cooper on the end. It's Louise Steele from Framptons Town Planning. Apologies from Peter Frampton. Um, here on behalf of a Mr John Padfield, and it's in relation to site EPPR1, which is the western part of the South Epping Master Plan. Thank you. I'm Mike Newton from Boyer Planning, representing CEG and Hallam Land Management in connection with the Latin Priory side. Uh, Francesca Hill from Sorders, representing Mr and Mrs Schofield and Mrs Marshall, who own land within the Water Lane um, strategic master plan area. Thank you. Roland Bolton, DLP Planning, representing Peer Group. Paul Kesselheim from David Locke Associates, representing the Fairfield Partnership. Hazel Izod from Sorders, representing the landowners of site Ong R1. That's Mr. Mrs. Eels White, Johnson, Kirker, and McKinney. Um, Ms. Rachel Bryan, also from Sorders, representing a landowner within the North World Bassett Master Plan area. I'm Andy Butcher. I'm from Stratton Parker. I'm representing countryside properties in respect of the North World Bassett uh, Strategic Master Plan area. Hello, Rich Cook, Essex County Council uh, from Planning. Laura Taylor Green, Essex County Council Public Health. Thank you. Any questions before we turn to the agenda? No. Thank you. Okay, so we'll start with issue one concerning policy SP3, the local plan, page 34. So the issue is, is the application of policy SP3 to all allocated sites justified and is it otherwise effective and consistent with national policy? So just as a start, um, the fact that policy begins with part H rather than A is just acknowledged as a typographical error to be corrected, so an additional modification will be sufficient for that. Um, an error in the paragraph numbering from paragraph 2.95 on page 35 has also been drawn to my attention. So to be corrected in the same way by way of an additional modification. Um, so the first main point on the agenda is then the question of whether it is justified to, ap to apply policy SP3 to all allocated and windfall sites regardless of their size and whether it is justified to apply it to all development proposals which is the wording used, I think, in the, um, 
in, in this sort of opening to the policy. So th the council has explained that policy SP3 is intended to apply to all allocated and windfall sites. But to my mind, paragraphs 2.8, 4, 8, 5, and 8, 6 all refer specifically to allocations. Um, and indeed, participants have identified that the use of the term development proposals in part H, which should become part A, would include a range of other types of development. Um, so I was just hoping the council could perhaps first offer some clarity on, on that matter and just explain by way of opening this topic the purpose of the policy and clarify exactly which type of development it's intended to apply to and then outline whether it's justified to apply it to that type in each case. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Um, you're quite right that paragraphs 2.84, 85, 86 do refer to um, allocations. However, policy SP3 as a whole um, is, uh, we, we consider it is justified in applying to all development proposals um, for the reasons which are set out in our matter seven hearing statement, paragraphs two to six. Um, we, we consider that policy SP3 in uh, provides a holistic approach to play shaping principles um, and we believe, a, believe that they can cut across a range of different developments um, rather than focusing just on site specific requirements. It is not considered um, appropriate or possible to set a size scale or threshold for application of these general play shaping principles. However, the wording of each policy criteria in conjunction with the supporting text does make clear that a proportionate approach should be taken to the application of the requirements. Um, and in some cases, certain criteria clearly may not be applicable. Thank you. Would anyone like to comment on that before I ask my questions? And Ms. Bryan? Um, my, I take what the council is saying and, and welcome the, the fact that it will be a proportionate approach, but I feel that, as worded, that isn't what the policy says at the moment. So I think there is a need for some clarification in the policy to make it more effective. Um, although I didn't um, make specific reps on this, I would just um, give the examination, examination the benefit of my experience in dealing with um, applications. Um, applications are dealt with by um, a different part of the service than the plan making. And therefore, if a proportionate approach is envisaged, it needs to be in policy terms so that it's clear. It's all like us sitting around the table saying, oh yes, when it was debated at examination, it was going to be applied in a, in a proportionate manner. And you get a DM officer, and they'll just read the policy. So yeah, if, if that's what's intended, then it needs to be explicit. Um really, really the similar point, and in our statement we've suggested um, some amended text that may help with that point, and we're just wondering, instead of saying adhere to, we could say something along the lines of must reflect the following placemaking principles with respect to the scale of the development proposed. Yes, ma'am. Th th thank you for that. Um, I uh, have to say I have some reservations about the way the policy is, is expressed and, and the confusion, the ambiguity that we've got here. Bear in mind that um, uh, people who pick up the plan will not all be planners and they will need to understand where these policies apply. It does seem to me that the purpose of the, shape, uh, the place shaping policy is pretty well directed to what I would call major developments 
and particularly those of a size that uh, require the various criteria set out within the policy to be applied. It does seem to me that um, it would be helpful if the, if the, if the policy were to be uh, clearer in its terms because, um, as, as the point has already been made, as it reads, it, it would suggest that uh, the policy applies to, to all development proposals and, and clearly that is not the case but unfortunately that's, that's how it appears in the policy. So you have a series of criteria which potentially would apply to even minor development which I think would be uh, clearly unreasonable and, and, and unnecessary and it seems to me that um, that there ought to be some clarification either within the policy or the supporting text to be clear about uh, where this this policy applies to. It seems to me that, um, and, and I have no objections at all to, to a place-shaping policy, but it should have a function perhaps of an overarching policy towards uh, how uh, schemes are to be in, interpreted and, uh, and provide a clear guidance for the development management process. And, and at the moment, <coughs> the ambiguity, excuse me, the ambiguity in the policy, I have to say, uh, doesn't uh, fill me with a great deal of confidence. Thank you. Thank you. I think Mr. Butcher's probably covered most of the, the points I wanted to make, but also just to add that, as it stands, the wording doesn't actually cover concept framework areas. Um, I think your question was framed in, in the way of allocated sites, um, but it, it refers to strategic master plans and development proposals. So obviously for a site within a concept framework area, although the planning applications would be subject to policy SP3, the actual concept framework at the moment is, isn't covered. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, I, I agree with the comments that have been made and, and just wanted to add that in many cases it is not possible to even adhere to every single point that's been made in the policy and by saying it must adhere to suggests that all points need, need to be dealt with um, and there are housing sites that, where employment doesn't come in and vice versa. So, <coughs> so a range of... A, a range of kind of common points that have been raised around the table. Um, before, we, before we perhaps come on to that, could you, could you just say a little bit more about the, the comments that uh, Mr Butcher made at the back about whether it's appropriate to apply this to the more minor types of development? Thank you, Madam. Um, yes, we believe it is, in a, again, in a proportionate manner. So um, it, it will apply for certain types of development more than for others, and it will depend upon the nature of that proposal and the scale of that proposal. But Overall, the, the principles that are set out should be aspired to as far as possible for all proposals coming forward. Okay, well, if I, if I give you again my, my initial take on this, I think from, from what I've read and from what most people are saying around the table, there's no particular concern about, in, in principle, in applying these, these principles, if you like, to all, all types of developments, and that, that could be useful. But if that's the intention, certainly to me and to other people around the table, it isn't as clear as it should be for development management purposes. So, first of all, I would suggest that the, the introductory wording needs to be clearer about the types of development to which it's intended to apply. So if it is all developments, then you know, it could say all development. Um, and, I ha and the supporting text as well in those paragraphs that I mentioned at the beginning could be clearer on that matter. So if it isn't just allocated sites, it shouldn't make it sound like it, like it is. Um, and I, I have noted, I think probably from your, from your statement, that um, it doesn't refer to concept frameworks and I think it was noted in the, in the statement that policy P4 concerning ONGA refers back to SP3, but SP3 doesn't, rep, doesn't mention concept frameworks at all. So that's a, an inconsistency that does need to be dealt with. And then I think, so, so there's, a, there's just a clarity point there about what it's intended to apply to. And the second point is, I, I do think it's necessary to clarify somehow that not all proposals can be expected to comply with all of the criteria um, in that policy. And I think you gave a, a useful explanation in your um, statement in paragraph five. So if there were some, some form of wording that could be introduced into the plan that, that covered that explanation, that could be helpful. And again, um, the point that's, that's come up several times is this requirement to adhere to the principles when actually it's impossible to adhere to them in a, in a number of cases. So that's not, not an appropriate form of wording. Um, otherwise, Yes, I, I think in, in principle it's okay, but with, the, with those amendments for clarity and effectiveness would be, would be the test, I suppose. Yeah, we're very, very happy to take that away and, and make Thank those changes.
Thank you. Did you have new new points on that? Or yep, besides. Just one point, that if, if that policy is intended to apply to all development proposals, whether it is in fact a, a place-shaping policy, something like an air conditioning unit, is that really place-shaping? I'm just questioning whether the, uh, the title of the, of the policy really does reflect the intentions. Just a minor point there. I, I think we, we, we can reflect that in, in the proposed changes that we make but also I think the principles do apply to development generally but obviously we'll take into account what's been said thank you thank you so we move on to the second question on the agenda which is whether the density requirements set out in part I of the policy are evidence-based. Perhaps you could just um, explain how the density ranges set out in I2 and I3 were arrived at. Certainly, Madam, thank you. Um, so they are evidence-based to start with, and I can give you some, uh, give you the details as to how we have arrived at them. Um, one of the, the key documents that has informed the density requirements is the Strategic Land Availability Assessment, which is EB 800. Um, and in particular, paragraph 5.3 of that report um, supports those density requirements. Um, in addition, um, applying density ranges to sites within the district was demonstrated overall to be appropriate through the Settlement Capacity Study that is EB803, and that's particularly paragraphs 2.9 uh, to 2.21. Um, and I'd, I would also refer you to Appendix 8 of that document. Um, two other documents which have assisted in, in informing the density requirements uh, the Landscape Character Assessment from 2010, that is EB709, and the Settlement Edge Landscape Sensitivity Study 2010, that's EB712. Did anyone want to raise anything about the density ranges they were set? No. Thank you. Okay, in, in relation to those density ranges, in my MIQs, I sought some clarity about the areas to which part I, three and four were intended to relate. And the council has suggested an amendment to part I-4 in its statement, which would provide the clarity that I sought. Does anyone have any comments on that modification? As that would be a main modification as set out in your statement. Okay, so moving on to the next question, which is whether the plan as a whole promotes healthy communities beyond the connectivity or transport-related aspects of facilitating social interaction. So within places themselves, will issues such as crime and fear of crime, provision of community facilities, open space and recreation be adequately addressed? I hear the, the council statement explains quite carefully how the plan deals with the connectivity or transport-related aspects of facilitating social interaction but it says less about how the PAN will promote this within places once people have arrived there. So my specific question before we open the floor to the others is, have issues such as crime, the fear of crime, provision of community facilities, open space and recreational facilities been adequately addressed in the plan? Thank you, Madam. Um, the answer is yes. Council does consider that the plan as a whole, um, incorporating policy SP3 together with a range of other policies, and promote a holistic approach to the issues you've outlined. Um, 
in relation to creating healthy, inclusive and safe places. Um, we believe that the policies provide the, the social, recreational, cultural facilities, etc., and services that the community will need in accordance with Section 8 of the MPPF. Um, as you've said, uh, our hearing statements, um, paragraph 16 to 18, provides further explanation. Um, specifically, beyond policies relating or policy requirements relating to connectivity and transport, there are a number of other policies and supporting statements within the plan that promote healthy communities. Um, I have a, a list of, of these which I could go through or we could supply to you separately. I think it would be useful. Go through, yep, certainly. Policy SP4, uh, this promotes provision for self and custom built homes and the needs of an ageing population, together with a range of walkable community facilities. Policy H1, that promotes a range of accessible and adaptable house housing types which are accessible and adaptable. Policy E2 promotes vibrant and attractive uh, town and district centres with active frontages. Policy DM5 promotes the incorporation of new and enhanced green spaces and public realm uh, within design proposals. Policy DM6 promotes access to and provision of open spaces within development proposals. Policy DM9, design measures should reduce social exclusion, the risk of crime and the fear of crime, integrate landscaping, maximise safe connectivity and active frontages in the public realm. Policy DM10 promotes mixed tenure housing with accessible amenity space and play space. Just got two more. Mm -hmm. Policy D4 promotes maintaining enhancement or creation of high quality and accessible community facilities co-located with leisure and cultural facilities. And lastly, policy D5 promotes enhanced digital connectivity and accessibility. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'll, I'll ask my next question because I think the County Council obviously have something to, to say about this. But um, so, so in, in light of in light of what we've heard, um, my last sort of question on issue one was whether a separate overarching policy on health and well-being is required. I, I understand that the County Council would have, would have liked to have seen such a policy covering health and well-being issues. Um, so perhaps if I could turn to the, the County Council first, if that's what you, if that's what you were here to, to discuss. Um, and if you could, in your answer, perhaps outline anything that you think is missing from the plan at the moment and what the, pe what the benefit of an overarching policy would be. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, although we do feel that throughout the um, <coughs> local plan as it stands at present, there are elements of health and well-being, um, and as that's been discussed just now, having an overarching health and well-being policy makes it very clear um, to readers of the plan, including developers, what the aspiration is for creating healthy communities. Um, as you'll be aware, um, plan making guidance and the role of health and well-being goes beyond some of the elements of those policies, including access to healthier food environments, access to green and blue infrastructure for physical activity and recreational purposes, social cohesion and integration, especially amongst an ageing population, play, play spaces for children, um, and generally goes to promote um, physical and mental well-being, as well as reducing health inequality. We feel that by having an overarching policy, it becomes very clear as to what's expected from developers. It allows the signposting to local health and wellbeing strategies, policies and evidence. 
It also would allow the signposting to the Essex Design Guide, which in its recent iteration includes elements of how to support ageing populations and health and wellbeing through the design process. And it also allows the introduction to developers specifically to the use of health impact assessments as a way of assessing health and wellbeing of both the positive and the unintended consequences of um, proposals. In addition, we feel that um, public health is part of placemaking principles and much of this can be um, supported through pre-application advice and guidance. And as the plan currently stands, it's difficult to see how developers um, would actually understand and be signposted to the relevant um, advice that can be sought. Thank you. Could we perhaps ask any of the developers around the table for their, um, their views on whether such a policy would be helpful in their experience? Sorry to put you on the spot. Thank you, Mr. Butcher. Okay, so I'm on the spot. Um, I, I, I don't really have any objections uh, to, to what the county council is suggesting. Uh, question, uh, Mom, through you to um, the council. Uh, reference has just been made to the Essex Design Guide, which we, we know and are familiar with. Um, what I'm not entirely clear about from our perspective is where the Council stand with the, the Design Guide at the moment, because it has been going through various forms um, and changes in recent times. So what I'm not clear about is whether that is part of the um, supplementary planning guidance documents or whatever else that um, you might want to call it. So I, I don't know if... Uh, David or somebody could just clarify that point because obviously it's an important document from a developer's perspective because it helps to inform uh, development design and layout. Okay, well, I'll ask, ask the council to come back on the on the council's uh, on the on Essex County Council's comments. Oh, sorry, should we, should we finish with Mr. Cook? Do you want to add something? Then we'll. I was just going to offer to uh, help with that question, if you like, actually, from the County Council's point of view. So certainly the Essex Design Guide has been undergoing a series of updates and additions in response to a number of new issues, one of which is public health, other things that we've mentioned briefly today, like digital connectivity and things like that. Certainly in terms of its status, I can advise that it's not intended to represent formal SPD, it's meant to represent guidance. One of the reasons for that is because the fact that things are changing over the course of time quite often fairly quickly, uh, one of which is the public health agenda, and to keep that guidance up to date, useful and fit for purpose, and as beneficial as possible for developers, the decision was taken not to treat it as formal SPD and to make that available on an up-to-date basis and a convenient basis for developers and users in a similar way to the plan and pr planning practice guidance nationally. Hope that helps. Okay, could, could the council comment on um, the, the, the points made by Mr. Taylor Green and whether you consider that the plan covers all of the issues that she's concerned about and whether there is a risk in the way that it's presented that a developer wouldn't be fully aware of their responsibilities or they wouldn't get the value from the documentation available? Um, we feel that the plan is already sufficiently clear um, in making, making the requirements, uh, setting up the requirements, bearing in mind that the policies need to be read as a whole anyway. And we also think that any specific requirements that need to be picked up at development management stage would be done so through a validation checklist, particularly requirements for uh, a health impact assessment, which would make sure that developers were were aware of the responsibilities and the requirements at that stage, um, even if they hadn't picked it up from the plan. Um, equally, in terms of the importance and the role of the Essex Design Guide and other guidance, um, policy DM9 um, within the plan does make specific reference to the need to, to look at supplementary design guidance, including the Essex Design Guide. Um, so in summary, we, we feel that um, that the references in there already are sufficient. OK, 
Okay, and we, I mean, importantly, we, we also feel that um, without, that it's not an issue of soundness, essentially, that without uh, an overarching policy, it doesn't make the plan unsound. In terms of the points Ms. Taylor Green made about signposting the relevant guidance, for example, she referred to um, well-being strategies and things like that. Are they signposted within the plan? Um, thank you, ma'am. Sorry for the delay. Um, within the supporting text to DM9, we do set out uh, the need to consult with, with supplementary guidance, uh, not specifically in relation to health and well-being. Um, the only thing I would add to that is that, obviously, there is concern here that strategy is changing and go out of date, and we need to make sure that the plan is robust for the lifetime of the, the plan period and that that is more appropriately picked up during, um, through the, the local information requirements for the validation, for validation, which is more regularly updated. Just thinking about the, the, the heading that this, that this comes under, and I, I, haven't, I haven't reached a, a view about this yet. There's something I'll, I'll take away and have, a, and have a think about. But we've been discussing, obviously, that the place-shaping policies and the overarching um, you know, principles that you want to apply to every... Um, to every development, is is health and well-being reflected within that, or could it could it be could it be beneficially, even if even if I decide that a a whole policy is not required given what's in the plan, would it be appropriate to have a criteria in an existing place shaping policy which would at least then provide a single point at which you would be able to signpost people to all of these different factors? I think that could be very beneficial. We'd be very happy to take that away and, and review and then come back, if that's it, helpful. Is that something that the County Council would... As I say, I haven't, I haven't reached a view yet. I'll take it away and have a, have a think about the points that you've raised. But if I were to decide that everything was covered and it wouldn't be necessary for soundness to have another policy, would it be helpful if the overarching place shaping policy drew specific attention to the different strands of health and well-being to be considered? Yeah, certainly we think that it should be dealt with in the design uh, areas, the design policies and the place shaping policies, certainly at the moment compared to some of the treatment of some of these areas around health and health impact assessments, whereby they are seen as an infrastructure issue. That touches on other areas of the County Council's representations and case. But uh, again, it's, it's, it's quite fundamental to the County Council that this is seen as an upfront design consideration, really, and in a very explicit and well-informed way. Um, one of the County Council's issues is the process by which the evidence has been looked at or uh, taken into account in forming the overall vision and objectives and therefore a specific policy <coughs> response within the plan. So um, in, in our view, we don't see a specific policy response that responds to things like the strategies in the forms that uh, we've mentioned in our statements. There's a county-wide joint strategy as well as a, a local strategy. And the other thing we have pointed out is that a local plan needs to be both informed by and a means of implementing those strategies, which at the moment just doesn't seem to come through. As I say, I need to think about it um, more carefully, but perhaps it might be worth the council just spending a little bit of time, perhaps working up a, an amendment to policy SP3, which would then have the reference to health and well-being at the front of the plan um, and then would alert developers that that's something that it would need to look through and can look throughout the plan to, to get the specific policies without perhaps needing the introduction of a whole new policy. 
if you could give some consideration to that and then I'll, I'll have a look at it, that would be, that would be helpful. We'd we'll be Thank very you. happy to do so. Just to flag up, Madam, that there are already references in Policy SP3, so it might mean changing some of those, uh, but we can look at it as a whole and come back to you with suggestions. Yeah, it, it seems to me that the County Council are concerned to sort of draw it all together into one place so that nothing's missed and then there might be a, a little bit of wording that could be put into the supporting text to signpost some of these strategies to make sure they're not overlooked. Thank you. Mr. Butcher. Mum, thank you. You were picking up on the point that I was making. Uh, in my hearing statement, I'm afraid I have taken the liberty of um, uh, copying to you uh, Chelmsford City Council's place shaping policy, um, which I would suggest is a reasonable example um, that could be considered. Uh, and there's a clear bullet point within that policy which simply says provide opportunities to promote healthy living and to improve health and well-being. And it seems to me that words along those lines would surely meet that objective. Thank you. Anything else on issue one? Thank you. Okay, so turning now to issue two, are the plans requirements for master planning, as explained in paragraphs 2.89 to 2.102 of the plan and set out in policies SP4, SP5 and certain of the place policies in Chapter 5, are they justified and will they be effective in securing the timely delivery of comprehensively planned schemes? So again, I'm sure a lot of this will be interrelated and there'll probably be some overlap but we're doing quite well for time so I'll just I'll start with my first bullet point so first of all I want to talk about the operation of and the justification for the quality review panel which is mentioned in those policies and specifically whether it's practicable for the requirement for review to be generally applicable or whether significant complex or contentious schemes should be identified at the outset of the process um, so just for some clarity for, for me to start with it's my understanding that the panel is expected to review all schemes requiring a strategic master plan or concept framework. So that would be 11 schemes that are listed in paragraphs 2.9, 9.1 and 9.9. Um, approximately how many other allocated sites would be subject to review under the thresholds in this policy? And is that is it re basically just trying to get a sense for the number of proposals that would have to go to this design panel and whether that's realistic. Thank you, Madam. Um, so the, the criteria uh, are set out in our hearing statement. Um, it's 50 dwellings or above, or 5,000 square metres or above of commercial floor space. Um, that w I, I can't give you the exact number of how many allocations or uh, would be impacted by this, but it, it clearly would be the majority of the allocations in the plan. Um, and as you said, also the strategic master plans and the concept frameworks. Could you just, just remind us broadly of how many yep. approximate allocations there are? We've got about 80 allocations, and because we've allocated sites of six or more dwellings up, actually, I, I don't think it is the majority because we've got a, quite a large number of, of small sites in the plan. We can come back to you with the exact number if that would be helpful. That's okay, it's just, a, just to get an approximate. I, I totted it out myself, <laughs> including, I, I, I think I was working out that it's about 26. I don't know. Don't <laughs>
Okay, so that gives us a, that gives us a sense of their of their workload. Perhaps if you could just if we could just start by asking the council to tell us how the process will work and who I know you've set this out, but it would be helpful if you could just discuss it a little bit. If you tell us how the process will work, who or what are involved and at what stage. Okay, thank you, Madam. Um, the I mean the overall intention of the quality review panel is to enable a front loading of the planning process to start with, so not to uh, induce any delay, in fact, to reduce the delay of delivery at the application stage, and in doing so, supporting the development of high quality uh, high and timely development. By way of background, the quality review panel was established in April 2018 and has been successfully in use now for, for 10 months. Um, so far, 16 review sessions have taken place on a number of different types of scheme. It's important to emphasize that the quality review panel is, uh, is independent from the council. Um, it's, it, it's externally managed and it's not decision making. But the intention is that it provides independent expert advice at key stages of the design process. Um, in a critical friend role, both to the council and to developers. Um, for information, the, the operation of the quality review panel is set out in the terms of reference, which I'm sure you've seen, that's EB133. I'll, okay, I'll carry on. <laughs> Might be our long lawnmower if we'll try and stop that. <laughs> in, in terms of the formulation of the panel, um, further details are set out in our Matter 7 hearing statement on paragraph 22. Um, but I'd like to stress that best practice guidance was evaluated by the Council in order to benchmark the type of schemes that, that should or could be considered by the QRP. Um, and it was concluded that the most be beneficial and most cost effective approach would be derived from assessing major and complex development proposals. Um, and this is something that the Council very strongly considers to be a sound approach. Um, we also think that flexibility in terms of the, the types of scheme under the threshold that need to be considered is important. But what uh, the terms of reference set out is that complex or contentious smaller schemes below 50 dwellings or 5,000 square metres of floor space um, could, could be assessed by the panel. Um, but that's to enable a proportionate approach. Um, so just to summarise, there are different types of review which can be undertaken by the panel, uh, from a chair review down to a full, a full review. So there's different levels of packages, and that allows for a proportionate approach to smaller or different types of scheme. The overall approach is intended to support the successful implementation of the place shaping policies that we've just been discussing in policy SP3 and also in achieving high quality design requirements are set out in policy DM9. Um, and importantly, we feel that the approach taken is entirely in accordance with um, the MPPF um, and particularly paragraphs 61 to 63. Thank you. Going back to the numbers for one second, you mentioned that it's been operating for 10 months and they've considered They've had 16 review sessions. It, does that mean they've considered 16 schemes in 10 months, or are there more schemes considered at each review? Thank you. Thank you, madam. The, uh, there's one session per month normally, and at each, uh, uh, sorry, there's one day of quality review panel per month, and at each day, a number of different schemes can be seen. We have had schemes that have gone back for second and third uh, visits. Not just um, not just the first time, but but repeated visits, um, and on a various different typologies, ranging from master plans to smaller schemes um, and to to strategies themselves. Thank you. Ms. Newton. Thank you. Um, as 
promoters of Latin Priory, we've supported the quality review panel process. Um, and we've had one review meeting and we've had formal feedback and we're in the process of responding to that feedback. So I just wanted to make the point firstly that, that we think the, the concept is sound and we're working with it constructively. I think the only issue for us here really is quality review panel response times and their workload, which I think is probably what you mm -hmm. were driving at. Um, I don't think that's necessarily an issue, but, um, but it would be worth considering. Um, and whether or not there could be specific priority to particular garden town sites, um, as I'm representing Latin Priory, we, we want to make sure that the quality review panel is available to us and, uh, and that the process ro runs smoothly and efficiently. Thank you. Ms. Still. Thank you. Again, we don't have any issue with the quality review panel. I think our concern is um, the delays it may cause in the delivery of housing. Um, the 26 that we've totted up is just the housing numbers. Um, in, and as the council have alluded, some of those sites that have already been considered have had to go back two or three times. On top of that, the quality review panel, there's a requirement in policy 2.95 for the, um, the endorsement, and I think we're probably going to come on to, from, from the council as well. So, as well, it's like another layer as well. So, it's, it's just really the efficiency of the process and the clarity of, is it the master plan? Does the application need to go back to the, the, the review panel as well? So, it, it's some more clarity, I think, needs to be made in the policies in that respect. Thank you. Um, a similar point to Ms. Steele. Um, um, about the the workload of the, of the panel, um, we've talked about the 26 allocations, um, and, but they, they do go back multiple times. The place-specific policies do refer to subsequent applications as well. So it's not just the strategic master plan or concept framework. It's the, the outline, the full, possibly even um, detailed conditions applications. And it could even refer to discharge of conditions applications, which hopefully it doesn't. But um, I think we need some clarity on... Um, their role and how much of an involvement they're supposed to have from beginning to end. Yes, thank you, Mom. Um, I, I won't repeat what has just been said, but we, we, we certainly share uh, some of the concerns that have been raised. In, in terms of the overall numbers, uh, it will be interesting to see what, what, what we are talking about here proportionately, because uh, on, on my guesstimate, we, we potentially are looking at 70% of the housing allocations in the, in the local plan being affected by this process. So, given that we are talking about the timely delivery of housing, uh, given that we are talking about um, a number of sites that will be affected by this process, I think, I think the, the point that uh, David quite rightly made is about proportionality, and we need to be absolutely certain that that is what is going to be applied through the plan. Um, uh, reference was made to the National Planning Policy Framework and uh, I draw attention to uh, our hearing statement where we, where, we, where we say paragraph 62 says that uh, design review arrangements be in place to provide assessment and support to ensure high standards of design. And I don't think any of us uh, on this side of the table have any, have any issues with that point. But I think what we are somewhat concerned about <clears throat> leading into some of the comments that, that have just been made is that it does appear as an express policy requirement rather than necessarily uh, a, a sort of advisory point. So I think what, uh, what our concerns are is, um, is it proportionate? Uh, we do have concerns, and it has been raised, about the resources that are available to, um, uh, to, to, um, to assist the process, particularly when uh, we, we all, on the, again, on this side of the table, do want to, to, to deliver housing. That doesn't mean to say that we... Um, would want to do that without uh, ensuring that we comply with other requirements of the council and we do uh, I'm, I'm sure collectively would say to you that uh, we, 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 we all want to deliver high quality housing and sustainable housing but um, I think to a degree um, I, I, I would suggest that some of the uh, approach or the, the approach of the council in this in this case may may be disproportionate and if it's not considered disproportionate then it needs to be made clear that it will be proportionate uh, and on a case-by-case -case basis. Before I come back to Mr Newton, I know you've raised your board again. Again, a bit similar to the last issue, it seems there's um, no particular concerns about the principle of, of, of having this process and that actually that there would be, there would be value and benefit in, in, in having it. Um, <clears throat> but there, 
There are, I, there do seem to be some underlying concerns about prior, the priority, proportionality, and perhaps the contingency if they are overloaded. And I don't know whether it, I think it would be useful if, if you're able to actually draw out the specific parts of each policy, perhaps that require this, and whether there is anything that can be done to sort of allay these concerns, if you if you like. So it, seem, it seems that um, it seems that all the the intentions that you have are there for it to be proportionate. So there is a mechanism in place. Um, uh, and perhaps you could address the specific point that's been raised about whether something requiring a master plan would go at the master planning stage, the outline stage, and then again. So I think it's perhaps just making, making that clear if that's not the intention for it to be sort of overly burdensome, if, if, that, could be, if that could be made clear. Thank you, Madam. Yes, absolutely. Um, the strategic master planning briefing note that we've produced, um, which I'll give you a reference to, um, I think it's um, EB133, um, does talk about the process for quality review panel sessions in terms of master planning. Um, and there are different staged requirements, um, which we've carefully considered, again, to try and keep it as proportionate as possible, but yet to maintain the quality standards that, that are so important for the council and for the district. Um, so I appreciate there is a balance, but we feel we've got the right balance. Um, and for us, it, as, as you've heard, the other concerns from participants around the table, it is very much about delivery and actually front-loading the process, giving more certainty to applicants by the time the planning application is submitted. So, um, but yes, we're, we're very happy to, to further consider um, and set out more clearly, if necessary, those requirements. One final point um, doesn't really go into the plan itself, but in terms of the operation of the panel, because it's externally managed, there are opportunities to um, try and seek additional capacity and arrange further reviews. So I think we take the point about prioritisation and that's something you know, we, we'll, we'll continue to, to consider moving forward. I have to say I, have to say I, haven't, I haven't done this for myself, but I don't know whether... It, are, there, are people concerned that certain parts of certain policies need to be amended so that the, um, so that the requirements aren't overly onerous? I mean, having a quick look at... Policy SP4, for example, strategic master, I can see there it says in part seven, strategic master plans and detailed design proposals must be reviewed and informed by the quality review panel. Now, is it, is it necessary to amend the policy or are the, assur are the assurances that we're hearing, is it, is it necessary to have a, a cross-reference somewhere else? I mean, how, 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 do you how do people feel that this issue needs to be resolved in the plan itself? Hill. Um, with a specific reference to SP4, I think there's maybe some concern that with the wording must be reviewed, whilst, you know, appreciate and, and agree in principle that strategic master plans should be reviewed by the uh, review panel. Detailed design proposals, there, there are various scales of detailed design proposals that might be coming in, and the word must suggests that all all detailed proposals, and I think that will come out, I think you asked that question later on as well, whether there needs to be a little bit more flexibility to enable um, a more common sense approach to, to whether or not the review panel has, has the, a, a role to play, a useful role to play in, in some situations. Um, also, um, the briefing, hang on, um, sorry, there's talk in paragraph 2.116, again, <coughs> similar situation, strategic master plan, design codes, and planning applications. It's a very broad remit uh, for the design panel to, to have, um, with little clarification for developers as to when and what is appropriate to, to go forward when they're, they're planning their, their timescales for trying to get development and, and delivering development. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I, uh, I raised my um, board because I thought we were drifting into the second question. I think you're taking the two together, really. Yeah. Um, I, just a question of in, ensuring that um, there is a specific remit for the quality review panel, I think. And, and for us, I, I think it's, it's most appropriate and applicable to the strategic master plan process. 
Once you get beyond that to outline planning applications, I don't really see the need for it because essentially it, it assists in establishing the framework and the basis for outline planning applications to be submitted. So in a sense, the work should be done by that stage. I think it's also, it would also be helpful if um, the process could be clearly focused um, and limited to the level of detail which, which is necessary because it, it, it's often the case that there's a, a tendency to drift into detailed design issues when that's not necessary. So there needs to be a, a very clear focus on what's appropriate to a strategic master plan, what the purpose of a strategic master plan is without delving into too much detail. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just to agree with the other representations, um, we feel if the master plan and potentially if a design code has been agreed and endorsed by the quality panel, it shouldn't necessarily lead to an automatic requirement for a full review of the subsequent planning applications by the quality panel, and there should be a flexible approach to that. I share all the comments that have just been made, and certainly from our perspective um, in relation to P6, uh, I think I do have some concerns that the, there is a requirement of policy that the master plan and subsequent application should be considered and informed by uh, the, the quality review panel. And whilst I wouldn't necessarily have a problem with that in the supporting text, um, I, I do find it a little bit worrying that it is part of the context of the, of the policy. And it, it seems to me that, um, and particularly picking up on the point that was just, just been made about subsequent applications, uh, it is about proportionality and perhaps agreeing at, at the early stage of the process of the involvement of the QRP, uh, what its terms of reference are not in general, which is what we've got at the moment, but for that particular site that you're dealing with. And that could be dealt with at, at the earlier stage and, and before they're actually commissioned to, to review the work. It's a very similar point, and it goes to policy P1 Epping um, part L of that, the, the end part of that policy. It's talking about the master plan and subsequent applications should be considered and informed by the quality review panel. You know, again, we can talk the master plan, the outline application, the reserve matters. It's, it's that detail. I think we need that clarity. Could the, could the council maybe give us its feeling on, on that point specifically, or whether if, some, if, the, if the point is to front load the process, um, whether once a, a master plan and a concept framework has been considered, if it's then necessary for the design panel to consider all of the subsequent, subsequent stages of the application process? Thank you, Madam. Um, to start with, I think we're very, we've, we've heard what's, what's been said around the table, and we're certainly very happy to, to take that away and consider the, the kind of operation of this and, and how it, it works in practice. Um, but we do feel that there are already several processes in place to ensure proportionality and actually to set out the remit of, of, the, of the panel. Um, on the particular point of programming and considering how this works through the process, we are encouraging the use of planning performance agreements, which from the outset will provide an opportunity to understand exactly when the panel will work and when it will be required and take a proportionate approach. Um, the other point is we, we do need to ensure that uh, where, where a master plan comes forward and then leads into individual planning applications, that there's a way of considering consistency through that, um, and therefore additional design, design review panel sessions may be required, um, following on from the master plan to look at a specific scheme for a specific parcel. But we, we understand the issues that are being raised, and we understand that the, you know, the, uh, ultimately this is about front-loading and, and timely delivery, so I think what we've heard has been helpful, and we'll certainly take that away. Thank you. I'm just trying to be clear before we leave about what, what changes might, might, need to be, might need to be made, though. Um, and I, I don't know, I don't know from, from what I'm hearing, whether it, might be, whether it might be most helpful to have a sort of proper explanation of this somewhere in the supporting text of how it's, how it's expected to work. And then if the policy requirements within the relevant policies, which I'll have to leave you to, um, to find, um, if they were perhaps, I don't know, if they were perhaps less prescriptive, um, but referred back to what was in the supporting text so that the process was understood, but the policy wording itself wasn't so directive about exactly what 
exactly what was required to happen. But if I, but if, I, if, I, if I leave that with you, I think from what, I, from what I've heard, it seems that you do, have, you do have these considerations in hand. It is set out elsewhere, but the wording of the policy perhaps suggests that a much more prescriptive process than you suggest is, is, is required. The only other thing that's occurred to me is that there's obviously wording in the policies somewhere in relation to the concept frameworks and um, master plan areas that's very clear that they need to be considered by the panel, but I'm not sure where it's clear that a general allocation of 50 dwellings would need to be subject to review. Whether that's necessary or not, I don't know, but obviously someone could turn around and say, you don't need to do it for these. So it might be that it's there, but I haven't spotted that it, that it is. Sure, that's absolutely fine. We'll take it away and look at the, the policies and the text supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll move on now to the, the justification for and effectiveness of the requirements concerning the production of strategic master plans and concept frameworks. Um, it, it, it seems from what I've heard around the table that there's no general objection to the, to the requirements to produce a master plan or a, or a concept framework. Um, it's more about the, that, that they will have benefit. It's more about the, the mechanisms and sort of risks of delay surrounding them. So we'll, we'll move on from my... My first question um, to the first bullet point, the status of formally endorsed strategic master plans and the requirements for general conformity or compliance with them. Now, the council has explained that master plans are not specifically required to be adopted as SPDs. Um, so in light of that, perhaps if you could just explain what the status of a master plan would be once it's formally endorsed, if it's not an adopted SPD. Thank you, Madam. Yes, absolutely. Um, strategic master plans will provide supplementary guidance, and this, this will assist developers and other stakeholders in bringing forward development and infrastructure with greater certainty and in a timely fashion. Again, um, master plans are part of uh, the approach the Council is taking to front load the planning process and to ensure timely delivery. Um, and this is particularly important where we have uh, master plan areas with a, a large number of different sites within it. Um, as set out in the strategic master planning briefing note um, I referred to before, uh, this is EB133, it is the intention that strategic master plans will be formally endorsed and then they will become a material planning consideration for pre-application proposals and then for the determination of applications to follow. The Council does require planning applications to be in general conformity with the master plans which have been endorsed um, by the Council. Um, and that will, will require applications that follow to meet the key principles of the strategic master plan. Um, but it's not intended to be overly prescriptive. General conformity with the master plans will ensure the appropriate coordination of different development proposals with different parcels within the master planning area in order to ensure a joined up and cohesive approach to development and also to the delivery of infrastructure. Thank you. Okay, so, so I think the, the clarification there was that once they've been formally endorsed by the council, they will be a material consideration for a planning application 
and that the policy, and I think the wording of the policy, although I think in one case it requires compliance, but we'll come back to that, but it, it, it's, it's intended to be general, general conformity with a master plan once in, endorsed. Does anyone have any concerns about the principle of that, whether it's clearly expressed, is perhaps another matter. I was going to talk about whether it's clearly expressed, so if we're going to move on to that, I won't say it now. My only concern with, with this is, is it in effect giving um, a development plan um, weight to something that doesn't go through the development plan process? I mean, you go through quite a long, lengthy process of examination here. The master plan is not going through that process. Mr. Beard, I can hear that would be helpful if you could give me your answer. It, it, couldn't, it, it won't, and it couldn't do as a matter of law in, in any event. Um, the regulations are clear as to what matters uh, ought to be in, uh, included in development plan documents. The matters that may, uh, uh, may be considered by supplementary planning documents the courts have identified there being a concept of residual local development documents, uh, but clearly those are, uh, are not formal in any sense, and, uh, and although they would be statutory in the sense that they are prepared under the Planning Acts, they most certainly would never be something of the order of DPDs, local plans as we call them now, or SPDs. They're not intended to have that weight, that, that, that status or weight. Yes, well, I'm just, just to confuse the matters a little bit further, I mean, I, I don't have any problem at all uh, from my client's perspective with uh, endorsement by the council um, uh, as a mat key material consideration. And I, I, I would suggest that does give uh, a, a strategic master plan considerable weight in the decision-making process that the council will undertake. I think my question is more about the council's reference to strategic master plans being um, capable or taken or capable or um, whether they will be taken forward for future adoption as SPD. Uh, I mean, cer certainly our view is that <coughs> uh, in the first instance, uh, it, it would be sufficient for them to be endorsed as, um, uh, for, as a key, key material consideration, and, and we see little or no need uh, for these um, to, to be taken forward as, as a supplementary planning document. And whilst I, I, I understand that it shouldn't delay the process, uh, clearly uh, uh, figure 2-1 um, does make it pretty clear uh, and, and, and fairly unequivocally, unfortunately, because of the way that the table is laid out, that the intention with strategic master plans is that they will be adopted as SPDs. So it would be helpful just to have some clarification on that point. The figure that you refer to? Uh, figure 2 1 on page what, 35. Thank you. I, I think the question is, what, what practical difference would it make, really, as to whether a, a, a document is adopted as a master plan or, or whether it becomes an SPD? Um, it, it is a genuine question, actually. I, I know there's a lot of um, case law concerning the role of SPDs, um, and what Mr. Beard said I think was helpful in that respect. I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, obviously, we, we, I, um, I do have experience of some SPDs, which have been rather a protracted process. Uh, that would be a concern should that arise. Um, the council statement does refer to um, the possibility of the master plans just being adopted as such, and in some cases they would be an SPD. 
So uh, the question is really what, what would be the difference and how would the council make that decision? I think it comes down to this just in general, as a generality of our approach. Um, the most important consideration in, in this kind of um, situation is that the document that is endorsed by the council or adopted formally, whether it's a residual L LDD or an SPD, what's most important is that it's been prepared with um, uh, appropriate engagement that, that the council can demonstrate that it is uh, listened to, invited participation from, listened to um, uh, responses and made changes uh, uh, to its proposals before it's endorsed or adopted. We are taking the position that, the, that we do not want to find ourselves in the situation where the formalities delay delivery. So there will be circumstances in which it might be appropriate uh, to prepare a document formally and formally adopt it uh, as SPD. But in the main, we are looking to ensure that we are adopting, uh, we are endorsing, preparing and endorsing such documents as quickly as possible uh, to, avoid, uh, to avoid delay. So I think the, 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 the headline is that we do not intend to resort to using SPDs, save where it is necessary or appropriate to do so. And I wouldn't have thought that it would be sensible um, to attempt to identify that in any uh, prescriptive way in the plan, um, because uh, the circumstances would inevitably not turn out to be as we thought they might be, and that would put our plan at risk of being out, out, out of date. May I just take one, some instructions, please? I think that's right. I just took some specific um, uh, instructions. We have to keep in mind that the circumstances are such that sometimes um, development will already have come forward. So there would be absolutely no point in those circumstances, or may have come forward in part. There's no point in those circumstances of going through the statutory process of preparing an SPD or, or the formalised uh, uh, the formalised procedure of adopting it. And of course, that depends upon which part of the council is making the decision. Um, so there must be flexibility in, in these circumstances and our approach will be uh, to make sure that we are not, uh, uh, that we, have, we are not causing any de delay, that we adopt the approach that's most flexible and provides the fullest opportunity for participation, proportionate and appropriate to the particular circumstances. Thank you. In, in, light of, in light of what everybody said, thank you, Mr Beard, that's really helpful. Is it necessary, is it, is it helpful that the policy refers to the need to, to SPDs? Is, is that wording just, is it necessary? Um, the, the intention is to say that they could become SPDs. So if, if that's not the case, then... Can, can you then just that's... point out where it says SPDs? Because I've been struggling. I know I've read it lots of times, but I can't find it. Yeah, sorry, we, we think it's actually the diagram itself, um, figure three, uh, sorry, 2.1 on page 35, which actually says um, that they, they become adopted as SPDs following the adoption of the plan. We can remove that part of the diagram if that's misleading. As I said, the intention is that they could become adopted as SPDs where that's helpful and appropriate, not that they must. I don't think it actually appears in any, any of the policy itself. If I may, there's a reference in paragraph 2.96 as well. Thank you. Okay. And you said DM9. 
Uh, yeah, it specifically says, well, it says that they need to be capable of adoption in, in DM9. That's the very point. Um, there must, uh, well, let me put it like this. Uh, the most important thing in terms of the weight that should be attached to a policy, uh, to, to, to a, a position taken by the council as a material planning consideration in a local development document, uh, uh, including an SPD, uh, will be informed by the extent to which it has been appropriately prepared, but most importantly, the extent to which those who have an interest in the, in the outcome of what's trying to be achieved have participated in the process of preparing um, the master plan or, or whatever it is. So the capability of being, the capability of uh, any document being adopted formally as an SPD is an important uh, aspect to retain in the plan because it may well be that we carry out we carry out the, the process of preparation in a way that is consistent with adopting an SPD, having regard to part five of the 2012 regulations. But we don't have to actually adopt it an SPD, we adopt it quickly by way of, we, we endorse it quickly by way of a, of a cabinet decision or the like. So that's the, the flexibility that needs to be retained. I think the proposal is, the suggestion is to delete the reference to supplementary planning document in the figure. I, I think that would be helpful because one can imagine the circumstances arising perhaps on an appeal to the Secretary of State under Section 78 that, uh, mis that there'd be a misunderstanding that something that is not an SPD should be given less weight or, or should be much less weight. Just to add to that, Madam, um, the document I've referred to a couple of times, EB133, which is within there, um, is the Master Planning Guidance Note. Um, page 100, uh, it's listed as page 133, um, explain the, the stages and the arrangements for endorsing the document. So that sets out the process as we see it, um, but clearly that's not in the plan at the moment. That could be inserted into the plan itself as supporting text. Sorry. Before, before we move on from this, we, cl we clarified at the beginning that the intention is for these formally endorsed master plans to be a material consideration and that there, is a require there should be a requirement for general conformity with it. Um, Ms. Bryan had a concern about how that is expressed in the plan, and I think I have noted somewhere that there is one instance where comply the word compliance is used rather than general conformity, would we let Miss Bryan speak and then perhaps we could clarify that? Yeah, I've noted um, a few places in the, in the plan where there's inconsistency in the wording. So um, SP3 says must have, a must have been adhered to. Um, the um, paragraph 2.95 says general conformity, which we, we are happy with. Um, DM9 says they're required to conform. Um, the placemaking policies say must comply. Um, the, the P6 certainly does. Um, and then the, the briefing note simply says they're a material planning consideration. 
Thank you. So again, I think that it's, it's clear is that the uh, main modification for all the relevant pol policies to clarify that it must be in general conformity. Is That's that right? correct. That's Absolutely, correct. yes. Last point on master plans before we move to concept frameworks. Yep. Sorry, just to, okay. to follow on from what Ms. Bryant said, it's also in SP4, it talks about be required to conform, so that's another policy where it needs to be picked up on. Mr. Newton. Yes, just briefly, I, I think this point may already be accepted by the council, but I think it's important that the master plan isn't part of a sequential process whereby the master plan has to be completed and adopted before planning applications are submitted. And I, I think I gather from the council statement that in fact a planning application process and a pre app process can proceed in parallel with a strategic master plan and the strategic master plan doesn't have to be adopted before the application is submitted or even before determination. Is that true of determination? If it needs to be in general conformity with a formally endorsed master plan, it would need to be formally endorsed, thereby completed, presumably before the application was determined. I, I think that might have been the council's position. I mean, if the two processes are running in, in parallel, and if the strategic master plan is well advanced, I think there may be the potential for the application to be determined on the basis of the development plan allocation. Um, Mr. Beard may have a view on that. Um, I think my point is really just to ensure that the process is, is as efficient as possible, that you don't have to complete one step before moving to the next, because that's necessary to ensure rapid delivery. Uh, before I ask, I can see the point you're making, but I think from everything we've discussed and the, change, the, the changes to the policy wording, that isn't what the policy wording would say. Uh, it, it seems to me that the policy wording would say that it should be in general, in general conformity with a formally endorsed master plan, which would suggest to me that it is a sequential process to that end. I mean, whether, whether the council may, in certain circumstances, take decisions not to do that, as, a, as with other material considerations, that's fair enough. But I think we need to be clear about what the plan generally, generally requires. And it isn't what you're saying, I don't think, along those lines. We can certainly look at that as well in terms of providing that clarity. The intention isn't to have a, a staged approach where you have to finish something and then you can't start the application process until a master plan is, is in place. But clearly there's an important uh, consideration of timing in terms of the submission of applications to make sure there's enough certainty in what's in the master plan. So I hope that provides some comfort um, and I think that's what we've discussed previously but we'll, we'll look at how the wording is in the plan itself in terms of making sure that that's as clear as it can be um, for applicants. Okay, we'll move, we'll move on now to concept frameworks. Can we, can we move on to concept frameworks? I have no problem with that. Can I just um, quickly say, can we look very seriously then in the light of that discussion at figure two one? because that does clearly set out the, the sequential approach. And I think what, um, what has been suggested is, and, and the way this is set out, is that you can't make an outline planning application until such time as the master plan is endorsed. And I, I picking up on David's point, would suggest there shouldn't really be a problem in being, a, being able to make an outline application, albeit it cannot be determined until such time as, as, as the, the, the master plan has been endorsed. So, it's just a plea, ma'am, just if we can just review that table in the light of those comments. We'll review, we'll both review the table and re review whether or not it's helpful for a table to be there at all. So we'll give that some consideration.
Thank you, Mr. Fletcher. Okay, so moving on to concept frameworks, a very similar discussion, I think, to be, I think, to be had there. Um, again, the Council's explained that once formally endorsed, a concept framework would be a material consideration in the determination of planning applications. Um, am I right in thinking, then, that a, the, a concept framework would have a different status to a strategic master plan? I say that because in the policy requirements in Chapter 5 and Appendix 6, they don't seem to require either compliance or conformity with a concept framework as the equivalent policies do for a master plan. I didn't know whether that was intentional. No, that's not intentional. I, I think the, the same should apply in terms of general conformity with a concept framework. So that may be an error that we need to amend. In that, in that case, it's, it seems that much of the same issues that we've just discussed apply, because my next question was going to be, is it justified to require a concept framework to be formally endorsed before a planning application can be submitted? Um, because that's indicated, someone's obviously raised that, it's indicated in policy P4. So I think, I think my understanding from the discussion that we've had is that the, the, the application process and the master planning process can certainly run in parallel. I think you do, I think you do need to be careful about being about the degree of flexibility that's introduced I mean it doesn't seem doesn't seem helpful to me to have a requirement to generally conform with a formally endorsed master plan if you then say that planning applications can be determined before one I don't see that there's any problem with them being submitted before one but if they think we were sort of pushing over here for sometimes they might be determined before one but then your policy wouldn't make sense no it's absolutely so be, not not the case for yeah. For that, it's only that they could be submitted before, um, right. okay. before the Thank master you. plan is endorsed. Sorry, yeah. that, that's, that. that's, that's helpful. Um, okay, so so the understanding is that, that the requirements really are the same for a for a concept framework. They would be formally endorsed to become a material consideration in a planning application scenario, but it isn't intended that a concept framework must be formally endorsed before an application can be submitted. Um, so that, that's the position. Does anyone have any concerns about that? Ms. Eisold. Thank you. Yes, my client's uh, own site, Ong R1, which is part of the West Ong R concept framework. Um, obviously, very supportive over the principle of the concept frameworks. It is some of the detail in this, um, a number of inconsistencies in the plan regarding concept frameworks. It sounds like they, they weren't intentional, um, but that does question the, the, the status of, of how these concept frameworks would be formally endorsed. So uh, you know, thank you to the council for their clarification because actually nowhere in the local plan or their hearing statement does it say that these documents, the concept frameworks should be capable of adoption as SPDs. Um, it does appear in the uh, briefing note which was appended to the council's hearing statement, um, which actually has, hasn't ever been published before. We haven't been able to um, identify this document previously because it wasn't actually part of the agenda. It wasn't attached as an appendix to the um, 18th October 2018 cabinet meeting report. So it's the first time we've, we've, we've seen this note um, that actually states that the concept framework should be capable of adoption as, as SPD as per the, the strategic master plans. Um, we do have some very similar concerns as with the strategic master plans in terms of the, the proportionality of this, um, in terms of the, the preparation, the timing, um, that really if, if it is to be adopted as an SPD that needs to be identified as early as possible in the process. I think the briefing note says um, that they may choose to adopt the frameworks as SPDs at a future point in time, but that really needs to be picked up as early as possible um, to, to speed up the process. Um, so, yeah, a number of inconsistencies. Obviously, policy SP3 is silent on concept frameworks, as is policy DM9. Uh, figure 2.1, which Mr Butcher had directed us to, is also silent on concept frameworks. Um, so, really, th th these inconsistencies need to be clarified. Um, 
but yes, there, there, there is that concern regarding the proportionality of it and the work that's required to produce this document to be capable of adoption. Thank you. Thank you. So, so again, the, the, the SPD question was, was raised there, and I'd noted that, was, that wasn't in the plan. Is, is, it in, is it, again, is it the intention that the same, the same sort of requirements about it being capable of being adopted to ensure an appropriate quality document? Um, it's, again, it's about what, what would be appropriate um, in, each, in each instance. Um, the concept framework briefing notes, again, EB133 talks about the process. Um, and um, to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't set out any specific SPD type requirements in the same way that strategic master planning um, briefing note does. So um, similar applies, but in essence, the concept framework approach is a lighter touch approach. Um, and that's reflected in the two different briefing notes which set out the principles uh, by which the, the two types of documents should be produced. Um, and I think we, we would be very happy to make sure that those principles are clearly articulated in the, in the plan where they need to be. And I appreciate that may not be the case at the moment. Okay, I, I think we've probably got as far as we can. It, se it seems really the, the, the supporting text probably from paragraph 2.89 onwards, um, where you have headings for strategic master plans, concept frameworks, the quality review panel. Um, I think it, it seems quite clear to me from, I'm quite clear now from the, the discussion what the intentions are. You just make sure it's clearly expressed in that policy and look carefully for, for consistency. We've heard obviously that concept frameworks are not referred to in those policies, SP3, DM9, Figure 2.1. If they're supposed to be, then then it, then it ensure ensure that they that they are. Um, a similar a similar point as well that comes up about the you know the wor the wording of material consideration general conformity. If compliance or adherence or anything creeps in there, then r remove it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on then. This is. A, Instances of disagreements between landowners and whether some sites within master plan or framework areas could come forward as separate entities. Now, I understand from the council's statement that the potential for difficulties in the master planning process, including landowner disagreements, has been considered. And you've mentioned the um, implementation team. I don't know if you could just explain a little bit about that so that we can get some um, comfort that there's a contingency. Certainly. Thank you, madam. Um, so... As I've stressed already, the whole intention of strategic master planning is to ensure timely delivery and ensure high quality development and infrastructure. Um, this is intended to be for the mutual benefit of uh, those submitting planning applications and also the council in terms of bringing forward housing. Um, in the case where disagreement were to exist between landowners or where it is proving difficult to actually establish a collaborative joint working approach, um, the council would act as a facilitator and where necessary, an arbitrator. Um, it's not considered, therefore, that this would present a risk to the timely delivery of development. Um, but essentially, um, as a last resort, if landowners or site promoters could not agree um, and could not work collaboratively with the council, the council would actually take on the tasks themselves and would facilitate the production of a high-level strategic master plan which could then be endorsed by the, by the council. That would enable uh, key parameters to be set, which would inform later submission of applications. Um, the key point around the implementation team uh, is that the council has invested in setting up a, a new team, the implementation team, which sits between the planning policy team and the development management team. And its, its purpose and remit is to deliver the uh, strategic sites within the plan um, and to take forward the strategic master plans and concept frameworks. 
Um, this is a team which has been developed over the last uh, year or, or so and is growing in number, um, in part uh, as a result of planning performance agreements which are being signed um, to take forward the, the strategic development proposals. So that team is, is capable of producing a high level plan should that be required. Um, but I would like to stress that at the moment there are no instances where that has been necessary um, and several strategic master plans are already under production as you'll, you'll be aware. I think it's important to say that the master planning process incorporates sufficient flexibility in terms of the scope and the level of detail to ensure that we can take an appropriate proportionate approach to reflect the circumstances. Um, and I think it's also important to recognise that the master planning is not there to stop development coming forward and actually facilitate development. So uh, it will recognise that and it will not unnecessarily restrict the potential for individual development sites to come forward um, in isolation. Thank you. Anyone else on that specific point? Thank you. Okay, and then has consideration been given to the possibility that some parts of some master plan or concept framework areas could come forward as separate entities? And would it be reasonable to delay development to achieve a comprehensive master plan? I th so I think I've, I've largely addressed this with my previous answer. Um, we do feel that it's vital that schemes that come forward are in general conformity with, with a master plan or a concept framework. That doesn't mean they cannot come forward as a separate planning application, and we, we expect that that will happen in many cases. But that's precisely the purpose of the approach that the Council has set out, is to give the overarching coordination for schemes, but without stopping them coming forward um, as it comes back to the key point being about having a, a process, a collaborative process informed by consultation, which is then uh, given recognition by the council and endorsed as a material consideration. That in turn gives the, the site promoter or the developer the planning certainty that they need to progress and submit a planning application, uh, which there, thereby helps to facilitate timely delivery as well as ensuring high quality. Well, just to, to support Mr. Coleman, really, I, I think the approach is is pretty well there. I think um, each site will will be subject to different constraints, issues, and, 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 and other matters, and, and these are really things that will have to be dealt with through this, the, the master plan process. And I think um, certainly for, from 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 our side, we, we would say that um, uh, these are these are issues clearly that, that the process has been set up to deal with, and, and one would hope again that. Um, all parties can take a fairly pragmatic approach, proportionate approach as, as to what, what's required. Um, it it's, it's really um, links into the DM process as much as it does into the planning policy process and, and how sites are delivered. So uh, I, I think the, the approach that uh, Mr. Coleman has, has outlined is, is, in, is entirely right. Yes, thank you. Just briefly, I just wanted to make clear from our perspective that we support the strategic master plan process. Um, we've been addressing matters of detail in relation to it, but fundamentally it can reduce the um, extent to complexity and duration of a pre-application process. Uh, it provides or can provide a sound basis for applications mm -hmm. and, uh, and also reduce the time taken to achieve resolution to grant and, and conclude a section 106. Uh, I think it, it has to be efficient and a time limited process and, and quite clearly defined, but it's a process we've been working with the council quite constructively on and, uh, and quite for, for some months now actually and um, I'd just like to endorse that as a, as a principle as well as making the detailed points. Um, in response to one of, the, one of the statements that's come in. Now, I recognise on, on Monday we talked... On Monday? Tuesday? On Tuesday, on the first day, yesterday, we, we did talk about the degree of weight given to emerging or failed um, neighbourhood plans in this process, but I just wanted to 
clarify the role of Chigwell Parish Council in the preparation of the Limes Farm Master Plan. I mean, notwithstanding the position with the Chigwell Master Plan, I just wondered how the council was engaging with the parish council to try to ensure as far as possible that the master plan takes account of the aspirations of the neighbourhood plan. Thank you, Madam. Um, so paragraphs 2.89 to 2.97 of the local plan submission version, as we've said, set out the, the overall approach to master planning. Um, but an integral part of that process will be consultation with the community uh, and stakeholders, and that will very much include the town and parish councils. Um, the, the specific kind of arrangements and guidelines for that process uh, are, are set out again in the uh, report I've referred to several times, EB133, by way of uh, strategic master planning briefing note. In the, in the particular case of, of Chigwell, uh, that, uh, that master plan is, is not yet commenced, and it's one that is phased to be slightly later in the plan period and in our program. Um, but as and when that, that is commenced, engagement with the parish council will be uh, absolutely key to shaping what comes forward um, alongside engagement with all the other stakeholders. I should stress as well that obviously the the policy framework in terms of policy SP3, but also in terms of the, the area-specific policies will provide the guidelines for that master plan and for the other master plans as they progress. Thank you. 